Please welcome to the stage Gavin Ballard and Piers Thorogood. This photograph here is the New York Toy Fair. It's one of the biggest toy exhibitions in the world, and it's considered uh, the event of the year in the industry. This year, it was the setting for the launch of a brand new direct-to-consumer e-commerce website, one of the biggest toy companies in the world, Hasbro. The site was launched live on stage by the COO and president of Hasbro, and in its first 24 hours, did 25,000 orders, which isn't too bad for a first day. But why am I talking about this? Well, the site itself was the culmination of three months of intense work by two Shopify partners. My company, We Make Websites, and Gav's company, Disco. But to understand how we got here, it's worth rewinding back to when Gav and I first met. Uh, so, like a lot of partnerships, it, it's, it's pretty, isn't it? Uh, like a lot of partnerships in the Shopify ecosystem, ours actually started at the very first Unite back in 2016. And Piers, his co-founder Alex, and myself were just having dinner with a friend, and we were talking about our businesses. And in that conversation, I think we really recognized a, uh, a similar approach and ethos to the work we did for merchants. We were both running agencies that were 100% focused on Shopify. Um, we had these small, scrappy teams, and we had a real love for just building stuff for merchants on, on the platform. And over time from there, our, our companies grew, the merchants that were knocking on our door got a little bit larger, and we started to discuss working together to, to help these merchants and solve problems for, from them. Um, and as you can see from some of the merchants and brands that we've had the opportunity to work with, we've had really good opportunities for collaboration. And that includes, of course, the Hasbro project that, that Piers mentioned up top. So today, what we really want to do is to be sharing some of the lessons we've learned and the changes that we've made in our own businesses as a result of working with these large merchants. And we think this is a really important topic to talk about because we believe that Shopify is entering a phase where it's becoming more and more appealing to these really large and complex merchants. And not just the success stories that grew up with the brand, like the, the Kylie Jenners, the Gym Sharks, the Movement Watchers, but really large, large established uh, retailers and brands that are moving into the ecosystem for the very first time. But of course, in order to be working with these merchants in the first place, we have to sell to them. So we're going to start off with the sales process. So how do you get in front of these big merchants? In the early days of WeMate websites, our brand was very much focused on small or single-person businesses and startups. So over the years, we've been trying to get to bigger and bigger merchants. And we've had to shift our positioning pretty radically. Big enterprise companies just aren't interested in the same stuff that small companies are. So when you're looking at repositioning, there are the obvious things to look at, like your website, your marketing materials, how your brand identity looks and feels. You also need to be thinking about some of the smaller stuff or the perhaps less obvious stuff, like how your proposals are structured, how they look and feel, how you run your client meetings, how your staff speak to people at events. Um, but perhaps most importantly, how you price your services. Pricing is a really big factor when it comes to your brand positioning. And we found this out the hard way when we were pitching for probably one of our first kind of big brand projects. We came in about 60% lower than every other proposal on the table. So at that, that point in time, the client's already thinking, like, are these guys capable of doing this work for that amount of money? Um, so you're, it's an uphill struggle. And we really had to cli climb back out to, to say, hey, actually, we can do it. We can do this. So yeah, don't do that. Um, The other, right, <laughs> before, before um, yeah, so aside from positioning, which is just one piece of the puzzle, I want to now talk about three key acquisition channels um, that really helped us get these big merchants. The first one is partners. So partners are our number one source of big leads. We partner with tech companies and service providers like the ones on the screen now, and these guys are all trying to do what we're, we're doing. They've got the same audience as us. They're trying to sell to these big merchants. And ideally, they're trying to sell at the same time that we are. So we've had really good success partnering with integration companies and ERP companies, because they're often selling when a client is going through some big trans digital transformation, 
which normally means that the website's going to be replatformed, which is where we come in. Um, but when forging these partnerships, another thing we're looking for is that they're mutually beneficial. For us, a great partnership means deal flow in both directions. That's sharing leads, pitching for projects together, together, and selling each other in. Another great acquisition channel for us is events. We've run the Shopify London meetup for over five years, and now we run a whole host of other smaller, big merchant focus events like breakfasts and dinners and uh, panel, panel events. And all of these have been a great source of leads for us. The Shopify meetup alone is responsible for two of our five biggest clients. It's not just running our own events that works well. We've also had great success speaking at events. In fact, speaking at an event is how we landed our biggest client ever, which is the De Beers Group. Um, their e-commerce director attended a talk by my co-founder, Alex, which is this handsome chap on the screen here, um, which later resulted in us working together on the launch of one of their uh, latest new brands, Lightbox. So if you're looking to start speaking at events but don't know where to get started, my advice would be to reach out to your partners. Tech partners are always running big events, so reach out and see if they can uh, get you on the billing. The final acquisition channel I want to touch on is content. Specifically for us, this is the articles we publish on our blog. Content marketing has always been a big, uh, big focus of We Make Websites. Um, our strategy is to publish free advice that uh, helps build trust and bolsters our position as experts in the e-commerce industry. And it's amazing how well this works. The sort of ultimate endorsement, I suppose, of this is the Hasbro project I mentioned right at the top. And they found us through, I, and I quote, our excellent content marketing on our blog. So uh, no thanks to me, of course. That was our amazing marketing team. So thank you if you're watching this later on. Um, yeah, so once you've got the attention of these big brands and they've inquired, um, now you've got to think about selling to them. So here are some of the challenges we face and how we've overcome them. The first up is convincing IT. The one thing we've definitely noticed that's different with big companies than these smaller brands that we used to sell to is that they all have internal IT teams. And unfortunately, these internal IT teams are quite stuck in their ways, and they like and are used to the technology they've been using for the last 10 years. So we're often in a, in a, finding ourselves in a position where we're have to, having to sell, firstly, the, the concept of a SaaS-based e-commerce platform before we can then sell in Shopify Plus, before we can finally sell in ourselves. So it's a bit of an uphill struggle. But one of the things we've found works really well for us is having a champion on the inside. I'm sure we've all heard this before, but you never actually sell anything to a business. You sell to the people inside that business. When we were approaching the Hasbro deal, our head of sales, Tim, sought out and met with uh, someone on, uh, on the inside that he just found through LinkedIn. And once we convinced him that we were the right agency and that Shopify Plus was the right platform, he then did the rest of the work for us. He was selling us in to all, of the, all the stakeholders internally. He was helping us win those difficult conversations with IT. It's not always as easy as that to find a champion that I appreciate. So uh, another tip that's worked well for us here is um, using your tech partners, who have almost certainly sold into this company that you're speaking to before, and reach out and see if they can get you an intro to the right person. Once you've got your foot through the door, hopefully via your champion, you're then going to be offered the opportunity to pitch. Over the years of doing so, here's what we've found work, works well. Show up in numbers. Big companies want to see, see that you've got uh, a big team, or at least depth to your team. So don't just take your salesperson. Take some of the key members of staff and show them, sh you know, show them the team they're going to be work working with. No concerns ahead of time. This is where you can rely on your champion. They're going to tell you who's going to be in that pitch what their individual concerns are, and hopefully how you can overcome those concerns. Sell your niche. It's pretty, pretty likely that you're going to be up against much, much bigger agencies. I know that's the case when we're selling to these, these brands. So the way we approach that is to really double down on our deep Shopify knowledge, because that's the thing that they can't compete on. And finally, be consultative and not salesy. Sure, you've got to have a big pitch deck, a good pitch deck, that sells you and your agency and how great you are. But the, re the best sales meetings I've ever been in are the ones where we're kind of digging into the details. We're solving their problems right there in the room, so we're building that trust, building that relationship, and then it becomes much easier to make that sale. 
My final tip in this section is on discovery. So previously, well, I suppose I'm supposed to step back a bit. Discovery is obviously something you need to do on any technical project. And in the early days, we just used to have that as the first line item on our project proposals. But over time, selling to these bigger merchants, we've realized that we need to sell this as an entire project in its own right, or it's an entirely separate service, I suppose. We sell it reasonably cheaply, so it acts as a bit of a loss leader for us. But it gets our foot in the door, it gets the client comfortable with us and our team without any major fi financial um, risk from them. It sort of de-risks it from their point of view. Now, technically, at the end of that discovery service, they could take the output and go and find another agency. Um, but in our experience, that doesn't happen because you've already built that relationship, they get comfortable with your team, and then you can get straight into that project. So the next question is, how do you run a successful discovery for a big merchant? Um, so for us, discovery is really about really understanding the merchant, how their business works, what their goals are for the project, um, and what their expectations are. And I'm sure that everyone who's working with merchants already is doing this to some degree, but I thought we'd just run through some of the things that we've found useful um, or relevant when dealing with these larger merchants. So the large merchants often have lots of different stakeholders. Um, they have really complex and und undocumented business logic. Um, and they also just have like a lot of inertia when it comes to getting people into a room to make a decision like, how does order fulfillment work in our e-com platform? So in our experience, this has meant that while you may have buy-in from the business as a whole on a project, there's still a lot of detail to work out um, and a lot of decisions to be made as you actually go through this discovery process. Um, and even if they have, uh, the merchant has a dedicated project manager running things on their side, we've had some bad experiences where we've sort of been letting them drive the requirements gathering. Um, decisions just don't get made or questions don't get answered and things get missed. So what we've found much, much better is when we're really, really actively driving that discovery process. So that's at the start, setting out a discovery timeline, being very clear about what we information we need from stakeholders and when, um, and probably most importantly, really using our expertise and our knowledge of the Shopify platform to provide our input and our recommendations and really tell them what we think they should do. And I think a really big part of that as well is just always be pushing for simplicity. And that means pushing back against requirements that are really complex, um, that we don't think are going to translate well to the Shopify platform, or that are just sort of prematurely optimizing for a scale that the merchant isn't going to reach until you know, two years after launch. I think we ran into a really good example of that, or rather a, a really good example of failing to do that in the, the Hasbro project. So as part of the work we were doing to manage their pre-sales and tokenized payments, um, we were going through this process of splitting orders after they were placed on Shopify into multiple orders uh, based on the line item type in the order. And we did all of this to appease a downstream logistics provider, um, which the Hasbro IT team was really wedded to, but it didn't really support per line item fulfillments in an order. So we did this, it works, um, but it did introduce a lot of extra complexity into the system. So there are a lot more Shopify API calls that need to happen for this splitting process to work. Um, there's a lot more noise in the Shopify admin when it comes to order management um, or just reporting. And it also means that there are a lot more overselling risks that we needed to manage. As it turned out, at the end of the day, this logistics provider didn't actually manage to fully integrate with Shopify by the time we launched. So we're now doing all the work to just revert that and go back to an order in Shopify. Um, and if, if we'd really been pushing a lot harder during that discovery process, um, asking questions of Hasbro, asking questions of that logistics provider, we might have uncovered that core problem at the start and just started with this from day one. Sticking with discovery, I know the word compliance is internal grown. It's not the most exciting thing to talk about, but uh, I think it is really important when it comes to larger merchants because it is one of the things that we've seen change the most during, um, during discovery for these bigger merchants. Um, so large merchants often have really big legal liabilities when it comes to things like data privacy or breaches. So they are really, really conscious of this when they're replatforming to Shopify or expanding on the platform, especially if it's their first experience with SaaS. So that means you get to spend a lot of time looking at things like this, a security compliance audit spreadsheet. Um, I can gu guarantee you it will be in Excel 97 format. It will have 15 tabs, and it will have a bunch of broken links to other files on the merchant share drive. Always fun. 
Uh, and they always have uh, these great questions like this. Uh, don't spend your time reading it, it'll hurt your brain, but uh, just notice the security buzzword bingo and the fact that it is question 11 of 68. So yeah, you can ex expect to spend a lot of time working through these, um, but there are a couple of things that we've found that are useful. Firstly, as you're going through them for the first time, just categorize your own responses in an internal spreadsheet. You can use that the second, the third, the 14th time that you do this. It saves a lot of effort. Um, and the other thing is just that now that we have a really good idea of what the merchant's concerns are around compliance, we try and turn that around um, by, by asking these questions proactively. Things like, do you need a data processing agreement? Or are there any geographical requirements around where your customer data is, is hosted? Um, and that's good because it, it makes us frame the conversation around compliance. We seem like the experts, and it reassures the merchants that we've got these things in, in mind and in hand. Um, the last thing that I wanted to flag around the discovery process was just around documentation, which sounds kind of obvious, but we've really realized how important it is to carefully document every single decision we make um, or requirement get that, that gets state, stated um, during the discovery process. That's whether it's us, the client, a third party, whether it's on a call or an email or face-to-face -face or anything like that. Um, and whether that is something that, like a requirement, that the logistics system has um, or that their, their team raises or it's the API contract between two systems. We just make sure that those key decisions and those key requirements are in the scope of work at the end of that process and that's something that the client signs off on. And that is in a big part to cover our own butts. It means that like a throwaway comment in a meeting where someone says, oh, I'm sure that the finance team can handle stuff in that format, doesn't come back to bite us, two weeks out from launch and that be our problem. Um, but it's also just a really good way to get really comprehensive documentation and make sure that we actually launch the project with everyone across the whole business and ourselves on the same page. So once you've got the discovery signed off, you can get into the project proper. In the last few years of doing this, we've learned a ton about the working practices of these big organizations and how they'd like to run their projects. And whilst you may face many of the similar sort of familiar problems or challenges that you face with smaller merchants, there are some things that are totally unique to these big, big companies. So I'm going to touch, a few, touch on a few of those now. So the first thing to mention is contracts. Now, in the early days of our agency, we built a really slick system where a client could have a proposal on a link in an email, read through it, click a button, and they'd si automatically sign up to our standard terms and conditions, and we'd just start the project. It was super simple, really easy. Unfortunately, those days are now no longer, and instead we have to wrangle with in-house legal, legal teams who like nothing more than to argue over the minutiae of legal clauses. And they also insist on using Microsoft Word and emailing files back and forward to each other as if a shared doc didn't exist. It's personally very frustrating for me. Once you've got the contract signed, the next thing to tackle is payments. And unfortunately, these clients don't really give a shit about your payment terms. <laughs> you just have to stick with theirs, which are often 90 days. And the worst we've seen is six months. And I'd also say that they're not very good at keeping to these uh, terms. But yeah, OK. Um, I won't name any of these companies, name and shame. Um, yeah, so if your agency, like ours, is heavily cash flow dependent, is quite a big consideration as to whether you want to take on these deals at all. And for us, it's getting the right balance between taking on some of these and then working with some smaller clients that have reasonable payment terms. Um, so another thing we've had to change is our project team setup. Um, one of the changes we've made relatively recently is that, I suppose, in, in, in prior years, we had the function of a project manager and an account manager all wrapped up into one role just one person's job, and they were responsible for building the client relationship as well as delivering the project. And I know this is fairly normal in a small agency, uh, but what we've realized working with these bigger clients is that the big agencies that have these separate account management functions are doing it right. So now we've made the split and our account managers are responsible for building relationships. They're strategizing with the clients. They've got a much longer outlook and uh, really digging into the roadmap of where these businesses want to get to. And that leaves our project managers to focus on delivering ever more complex projects. 
as well as individual role changes uh, like that one, we've also introduced new teams. So an example of this is the solutions team that we've recently introduced. This is a technical but client-facing team that sits sort of in between the other departments of our agency. And they're responsible for things like uh, running our discovery sessions. They help our sales team out with scoping and client requirements um, for the proposal process. And they also liaise with the client around architectural and um, technical decision making on the overall solution. And this has really been transformational for our agency bringing this in. And it's something that our big clients have given us really good feedback on. My final point in this section is on process and tools. Big clients are risk averse. And as such, they really, really love process, particularly around project management and QA. And you can kind of understand why when you think about the huge financial implications of getting something wrong, like a dodgy deployment. As a consequence of this, we've had to adapt and change our processes and tools to fit in with this. So our testing has become significantly more comprehensive. We now prepare much more detailed test matrices with instructions on testing every single component of the system, both for us and for the clients to use. We've introduced automated testing. Um, and we've also given the client much more visibility around our testing. So we now produce weekly reports on testing so they know what things are being tested and the results of those testing, the results of that testing. Outside of testing, we've brought in stricter controls around sign-off and deployment. We've formalized our change requests. And we've also introduced SLAs and escalation documents into our support, uh, support contracts. Occasionally, we've also had to use the tools and processes that our clients use. So a good example of this is on the Hasbro projects, where they forced us to use their project management system instead of our own. And you can imagine the additional workload that's, that creates. So really, my point here is that all of these process changes, and there are many more than that, are really just things you have to accept. Big clients aren't very flexible. So the key thing to uh, take away is to factor it in to, the, to your pricing and your timelines. Working with large companies has a significant administrative overhead that you just don't have with small companies. So the complexities don't just stop with process. So next up, Gavin will talk you through some of the more technical challenges. So I'm going to cover two phases, the design, um, the architecture of your solutions, and the development. So firstly, what changes when we're designing technical solutions for big merchants? So the first thing is we may not have the same control over the tech stack as we're used to. So larger merchants will often have in-house development teams, and they'll often want to be able to take over at least a part of the project after um, you wrap up. And that's part, partly to manage costs, but it's also a big de-risking factor for them. So for us, fitting in with the merchants, dev team's capabilities and needs has meant doing things like not using sl Slate for theme development, or uh, more, more significantly, like not using Ruby on AWS, which is our preferred stack, um, but instead using Python on Azure. And the technologies, technologies that you can and can't use really does make a very big difference uh, when it comes to things like your timelines and how you actually design your solutions. So it's really important to establish those boundaries with the merchant early on. The second thing is that we really think and stop and think about why large merchants are choosing Shopify in the first place. And it's not for the same reasons as a startup, that it's quick, that it's easy, that it's cheap. Because for large merchants, any sort of change is none of those three things. So we think that large merchants choose Shopify because they see the advantages in a SaaS platform of reduced hosting and maintenance costs, and probably most importantly, that they can take advantage of Shopify's innovation in the commerce space. So we therefore see ourselves as having a responsibility to these large merchants to design our solutions to work as closely as possible with native Shopify. Large merchants just, they don't want hacks, they don't want workarounds. They need apps that are really robust, that are gonna be robust and working in 12 months time, um, that are gonna be compatible with third-party apps and tools and integrations, uh, and most importantly, that are gonna let them take advantage of new features like order editing or delivery profiles or theme sections everywhere from the second that they're released. 
Large merchants are also coming to Shopify with really complex requirements. Um, and whether that is a whole bunch of different user flows uh, in, a, in a theme, or it's integrating with seven or eight different external providers, we found it really, really useful to just break those requirements down into isolated individual components that work really independently, but also really closely with Shopify. And so doing this helps us enforce a separation of responsibility, which makes it a lot easier to maintain those uh, components and a lot easier for multiple teams to work on those components, which is really going to happen more and more the more you work with large merchants. And that separation approach also really helps you focus that Shopify-centric design that I mentioned earlier. And it means that from a DevOps perspective, if you need to scale up one individual component um, because the merchant is growing in a particular area or something like that, it's a lot easier to do. I think a merchant that we've done this really well for is Ufoods, who's one of Australia's largest plus merchants. So we've built six applications for them, um, each with different functions, and they primarily uh, rely on Shopify for all of their data flow. So Shopify is the absolute source of truth across the business for all order data. So it means that if our custom recurring orders application creates an order, it goes into Shopify first and then gets distributed out to the data logistics or the um, data analysis tools. And so th they're all very independent. There's not a lot of communication be between the two, and that's really helped us when it's come to doing things like scaling it up as their delivery zones grow or they get more requests to the API endpoints and things like that. So that's design considerations. What about when we're actually building this stuff? Um, well, in, in the same way that the client may influence the tech stack you're choosing, they may also really influence the way that you're building on that tech stack. So th for us, that's been as minor as just using Bitbucket instead of GitHub, um, but it's also more significant, like trying to work out how your own pull request and uh, code review flow fits into a Jira workflow that has 14 different stages and six different individual managers uh, handling that. So again, that's something that's really important to establish early on with a merchant, understand what their expectations are for how this is actually going to get built. Piers also uh, already mentioned around testing and how much more in time and investment you need uh, with these larger merchants. I thought I'd just touch on a couple of the practical uh, aspects of that. Um, so for us, what we strive for for large merchant builds these days um, is very simplified version here, but one fully replicated staging environment for every single production um, environment on Shopify. And so by fully replicated, I mean all of the same apps, all of the same themes, the products, the contents, the integrations, the configurations. And that is a lot of extra work, especially when you're talking about third-party apps. Maybe you're paying for multiple copies. You have to configure and maintain them all the same. But it is absolutely vital for having a really safe space to um, to test out new features in full before it moves into production. Um, we also make sure that we have all of our source code in uh, uh, for themes and apps in um, GitHub or similar repository. Uh, I know that sounds fundamental, but it is still amazing to me how many large Shopify Plus merchants, multi-million dollar businesses, um, tens of million dollar businesses are still just opening up the, uh, the online editor and mucking around in there. Um, but once you have that, that repository in place, it lets you build on top, of, uh, on top of that the things Piers was talking about, so the um, automated deployment, regression testing, and that sort of thing. And the final point I, I will make on this is around infrastructure, um, which is probably most relevant if you're building custom integrations or custom apps. And so when you hear the phrase large merchant in infrastructure, you might just be thinking about firepower, like do you have enough servers to handle the load? And that is true, and you do need to talk to the merchant and understand what their peak and average traffic expectations are and make sure you provision appropriately. But we've actually found that the bigger questions around um, infrastructure are, again, compliance and in, uh, logistics related. Um, so that's things like needing to spin up multiple versions of our apps in different countries so that data residency requirements are, um, are respected. We've had to come up with SLAs and, and uptime guarantees and work out what we're comfortable putting into our contracts around that. And then finally, we've had to spend a lot of time uh, coming up with a lot of policies and procedures around things like data backup, business continuity, and disaster recovery plans. Speaking of disaster recovery, uh, I think we'll end it there. Um, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> But before we do, uh, a quick recap. Um, we've only got about 30 seconds left. 
So um, from me, uh, partnerships are absolutely key to attracting and selling to these big merchants. Find a champion on the inside and help them sell you sell, help them to sell. And make allowances for the big administrative overhead that you've got with these big clients and make sure you charge for it. Uh, and then for me, on the more technical side, I guess really that process of actively driving discovery and, and really making sure that you're pushing for simplicity while you're doing that, documenting everything, and make sure that the client is signing off on that. Um, I think from the design perspective, it's really important to consider breaking down things into components and making sure that what you're building is, is working with Shopify rather than against it. Um, and then finally, just the investment in, in testing that you're going to need for these large merchants. So that's it from us. Thank you so much for listening. Um, we'll be around just out there if you've got any questions. Hope you have a great Unite. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers.